I'd like to welcome you to our first MAPA uh, webinar. It's an exciting uh, event. My name is Mark Smith. I'm the head of new business here. I'm just going to top and tail uh, the webinar. And we've also got Anja Bath and also Tony Young on the MAPA side of things um, who will be taking us through. And Tony will be also be helping to field questions. So if you do have any questions, comments, things you'd like to raise, please use the questions uh, box and we'll pick those up at the end. There'll be a good question, a Q&A session. Uh, also, if you've got any things you'd like to cover, perhaps that we can't cover off during this webinar that you'd be interested in for future webinars. So this is the first of a series. We're just finalizing dates for the next one. So a little bit for those of you that don't know Grey Matter, we've been trading for about 35 years. We're based in Ashburton in Devon. We were founded by developers, and that's still one area that we have a very keen interest in the developer world, working closely with ISVs, app creators, uh, those creating IP and the like. Um, as well as that, we're a specialist uh, reseller, uh, working with people like Microsoft, Symantec, Adobe, all the sort of key big players. Uh, but the more interesting side of things are the likes of MAPAR, uh, some of the AI, ML, mapping, uh, cyber and OSINT, and a whole range of other technologies. And also, as you can imagine, a whole bunch of services that tie all that together. So, you know, outside of this, if there's anything you'd like to discuss with us, be more than happy to um, engage on those sort of things. So, yeah, as I say, please feel free, pop questions in, and we'll gladly pick those up. Make sure that this is as valuable for you as it possibly can be. And if, say, if there's anything else you want to take offline, at a later date, we can also pick that up and more than happily arrange a conversation with us and also the MAPAR team. So without further ado, we'll hand over control to Antje, who can take us through the key parts of the webinar. All right, thank you very much, Mark. So a very warm welcome from my side. As introduced, my name is Antje Bart. I'm working as a solution architect at MAPAR in the EMEA Alliances team together with Tony Young. And today's session will actually walk you through the next generation of a data architecture and how that can help you to cloud enable your legacy systems to leverage data um, locally, act on it locally, but also kind of have the possibility to learn from the data globally. And what that means we'll, we'll show you shortly. And also how you can take advantage of a cloud service uh, while eliminating the data silos in your enterprise. And as an example, we'll walk you through how MAPAR can help you with that, um, presenting on the global data fabric technology which we can offer. So at one of the last Gartner data and analytics conferences, Gartner actually talked about the scale value of data and analytics. And what that really means is that probably all of us know that data nowadays is very diverse. So it's not only your enterprise transactional data anymore. It's data coming from a lot of resources from different data systems within your enterprise, databases, different teams, different business units, but also sometimes data from external to your company. So there's a lot of data you want to actually leverage on the road to the data-driven business that everyone talks about. And data everywhere is basically also putting a lot of challenges because you don't want to create just yet another silo. You want to be able to kind of leverage data where it's being generated. And most of the time, as I said, this is being outside of your own enterprise data centers, probably. With data being spread across everywhere, the next challenge is also how to process it everywhere. Because you don't want to just like move all the big data sets to one location to be able to process it. You want to be agile and flexible enough to do the processing or run applications directly on the sources of the data. So with the challenge of data everywhere, there comes the challenge of processing the data everywhere. And also nowadays with having the data spread across so many places, um, trust is getting kind of the, the most important point here, trust in your data and also the trust for your customers um, that you are handling the data with um, the needed security and, and data sensitivity measures. In nowadays business, the other um, challenge you have to look at is timely responses, right? We're, we're in a real-time business world nowadays, so the faster, the quicker you can react to new data, to new insights, the better you can compete in your enterprise environment. And obviously, we're all live in a hyper-connected world, so it's not just that 
the more data is connected, but also your business applications and IoT applications um, need to talk to other systems, to other applications. So this is really kind of an industry challenge right now for, for most of the businesses, how to make that scale value out of the data and analytics and how to basically address those new um, technology challenges we're facing. And one technology and one architecture that can actually help addressing those challenges is the concept of a global data fabric. So when we look at what that really means is, as you see, can, can see here on the bottom, you have all the diverse data sets, sensor information, transaction information and data, all types of records and data you want to collect and leverage. And as those are, as I said, spread across different systems, maybe geographies, etc., they also tend to end up in different infrastructure environments. That means part of the data might be in your own um, company's data centers. Part of the data might already be in a cloud, maybe in a public cloud environment. There might be even different public clouds in use. Maybe business partners' data centers you need to exchange specific data with. So it's, it's really getting this data everywhere and, and also different infrastructures. And the global data fabric then, what you can see here in the middle of the graphic, is kind of a technology and architecture that tries to basically connect all those diverse data sets and help you kind of make this physical location transparent for the applications that run on top. And here's really just an example like the different applications you might want to think of because we have traditional enterprise applications. So that means your SAP systems, your database systems, MySQL, whatever you're using, um, they still want to have access to the new data sets. It's not just the new applications you might develop around big data architectures with the data processing here in the second um, bucket mentioned with maybe Spark technologies, Spark streaming, Hadoop technologies, etc. And even the more recent technology um, around machine learning, AI technologies and frameworks, so it's really the mix of all those combined even with the modern applications based on container technologies. Independent of what applications you're looking at, you want to have a general concept, a general data fabric that makes the data available to those applications wherever you need it and helps you to provide also with all the security and uh, access and management capabilities to manage and operate the data fabric as easily as possible with a few concepts and policies that apply to all the data and all the locations. So when we look at MapR as an example for, for such a global data fabric, what we can help you with is, if you look at this blue box here, provide you with a technology, with a software that can actually take in all of your different data whether it's files, it's objects, it's tables, or it's real-time streams, and bring that to wherever you need it in terms of the applications. So regardless, here on the deployment models on the, on the bottom, whether it's in your data center, it's a cloud, it's a multi-cloud environment, it might be edge location or containerized Kubernetes environment. So regardless of where you want to actually um, run parts of that data fabric, we can help you get that really in place, and then via an open set of APIs, provide the data access to any of the applications that run on top. So whether this is traditional kind of the enterprise Hadoop workloads, enterprise applications, advanced analytics around the Spark and streaming analytics capabilities, or even the new AI and machine learning tools. So if we look at it as more as a general um, question for characteristics of such a modern data platform, here are just a couple of examples where you should look at. So one is obviously scale. So you want to have the capability to start, um, moderate probably, and then grow with the data. So at MapR, we come from a big data background. So this is exactly how we work. So we have this horizontal scalability. You can start with a couple of physical infrastructure resources and then really grow with the data. 
And on top of that, we offer a capability that's the global namespace, um, really kind of the key element to enable the data fabric on a global level to kind of federate all the different deployments you might have. And we're going to look at this just in a minute. Also, you want to look at um, where you can deploy the data fabric. So it should be transparent, whether it's an edge location, an on-premise um, data center, or cloud, or even a couple of uh, hybrid and multi-cloud scenarios. The other important point, if you want to run your enterprise applications on top, is obviously the capabilities for high availability and data protection. So you want to make sure, if you look at the different technologies, that you choose one that can really help you in, uh, in securing your data and making it highly available. So look for technologies that help you in uh, snapshotting, in replicating data, et cetera, and making sure whenever there's an outage or a failure of a component, um, that the environment also provides you with capabilities for disaster recovery, self-healing, et cetera. And also something that, that we um, integrated in our platform it's the intelligent data placement. So on top of those um, characteristics, um, which also apply in general, obviously, we implement possibilities to really decide where to place the data, different storage tiers, et cetera. So when you grow and your data grows, you have capabilities and mechanisms to decide um, where to store or offload parts of the data to really help you build this tiered approach and make the most out of uh, out of the environments. So coming back to um, the discussion and, and the cloud promise, so many of you might have looked already at, at cloud offerings. Um, the promise is, is big, right? So you probably think about when moving to the cloud, you can leverage the latest innovations. You can reduce IT costs, scale easily, drive business growth. Um, you're more agile. And obviously, um, moving to the cloud, there's all the big promise um, that they take good care of the security as well. So the formula actually for your journey to data-driven businesses seems to be quite simple. So you might choose cloud for your new infrastructure. You add data for, as the digital asset nowadays. And on top, you just enhance it with machine learning, AI models. That's kind of the differentiator nowadays. And you end up with your results and, and the company profits. So this is what most people really think of when, when they look at how to, to go on that journey to a data-driven business. But the biggest challenge here is, um, apart from, from moving into the cloud probably, how to really make your data available. Because as we learned, data is spread across different systems, infrastructures, geos. So it's not so easy to kind of cloudify the data to make it abstracted from the underlying infrastructure. So here comes the reality check. If we, if we look at the path to the cloud, there are a couple of common moves um, that most people run into after um, working with cloud environments for a bit. And, and this is really also feedback we got from our customers. And let's just quickly walk through, through those five. So the first one is assuming you won't got, get locked in. This is particularly true if you're looking at using a couple of different services in the clouds. So for example, cloud services from vendor A might not be compatible, and most, in most cases are not, with cloud services of vendor B. So for example, the S3 in Amazon, not really compatible with the Azure Data Lake Store. So the more services you're using out of one particular public cloud environment, the more difficult it will be to move those application leveraging the services to another cloud another time. And why it matters is really because, as I said in the beginning, you might think you want to leverage the latest innovations, but that might also be the case in a different cloud environment, in a different public cloud. So you want to have a solution, probably a technology stack, which allows you to also change public cloud providers in the future if there's a better service coming up or even a more cost-efficient offer. So Mapper can help you with that, really to avoid the cloud lock-in. We can do this by providing you, on top of our software, a layer of open APIs. 
So you can run and develop your applications based on open standards. So for example, the AI and ML technologies, they run normally out of the box using NFS and POSIX interfaces. They have never been developed to use, for example, traditional Hadoop interfaces. Whereas if you're using analytics out of the Apache environment, they indeed, they expect an HDFS API. If you're also adding real-time information, real-time applications, they connect to Kafka APIs. Operational applications, databases, um, might use HBase or JSON, et cetera. So Mapper provides the whole set of open APIs. So you can really develop your applications on top of those and then really be independent from the underlying infrastructure. And that also enables the multi-cloud data and application portability. Looking at the second point, assuming you can get easily um, to multi-cloud later, which is kind of the follow-up from the first one. So data movement from one cloud provided to the other, especially also if you're looking at doing an inter-cloud or a multi-cloud setup, is not really easy. There is no automatic data movement. Sometimes cloud providers um, do provide an on-premise solution. They're starting to do that, but those offerings are limited. So what you want to have is a technology that enables you to use maybe a second cloud provider as a disaster recovery target and have an automated process to actually replicate data from cloud A to cloud B, et cetera, to leverage those two um, different vendors and public cloud environments for your disaster recovery purposes. And this actually comes back to this whole concept of the global multi-cloud data fabric, where the data could be stored, as I said, in different cloud environments across the globe. Looking at this initial concept of the global data fabric, what we can help with is even if parts of the data is installed in different cloud environments, let's say public cloud provider A in, uh, in the US, public cloud provider B here in Europe, you can still connect those different deployments with the capability we're calling um, a global namespace. And here's an example. So you can navigate through the different data sets actually by just working with it like local directories. And by that, it also enables us by federating those environments um, to replicate data easily from, from one, let's call it a directory or a volume to another volume. So for the technology, it's actually transparent. If you replicate data here from the US cloud member.com installation um, to a volume in the EU cloud member.com. It's basically just replicating data across over that data fabric. And by that, you're actually also integrating different clouds underneath and you could actually have this disaster recovery mechanisms to balance and, and to have different cloud vendors taking care of parts of your data. The technology also is aware of the bandwidth, so we can manage that accordingly and uh, yeah, serve the data where you actually need it. And by this, it's really enabling you application data portability. So here, just on an on a easier um, visual. So you can have different cloud environments. You just set up a piece of the data fabric in there. Um, the technology itself takes care of federating across and, and giving you this really global fabric. And you can then decide and automate where the data is being replicated to, where it's mirrored to, et cetera. And this also helps to kind of automatically synchronize, for example, globally distributed data. So we can make sure that you can actually process data where it's generated, but also replicate it to wherever you need it. Looking at the third point, assuming cost will always remain low. Um, Initially, I think uh, many, many people and, and companies think that move to the cloud will really like lower the cost. But then over the years, if you add more and more services um, you're using in the cloud, um, put more and more data in there, and you might want, need to move data and, and work with the data, you get charged quite a bit. So especially some cloud providers charge for data input, for data um, output, storage, movement, reads per second, writes per second, et cetera. So it can really um, go up pretty soon, pretty high on your bill. Where we can help you with is um, a couple of technologies we're providing. 
the newest one we actually just added to our um, data fabric is the possibility to tier data into an object storage. So by that, you can, as I said, initially help tier your data, uh, whether it's highly frequently accessed data or maybe offload some of the less frequently accessed data to such an object tier, et cetera, and by that helping you to lower cost and make most efficient use of the storage environments. But this is just like one of the, uh, the uh, technical functionality we can uh, provide in help lowering the cost. Also, um, the data fabric has automatic compression, et cetera, to reduce data and storage volumes. It helps lowering your costs by providing those industry standard open APIs because you save time and resources on rewriting existing applications. Um, you might even can um, use fewer of the public cloud services because we already provide um, built-in database and streaming services, so there's less need for certain um, additional public cloud services. If you're interested, obviously, um, we can look at your customized environment and provide you with a very custom TCO analytics. Um, I'll just leave that for the business people. So, but if you're interested, we can, uh, we can look at the cost and do a calculation, et cetera, basically on your specific environment needs. Getting back to technology on the fourth point, assuming your existing applications will just work in public cloud. And I just quickly touched on that. If you have a existing set of applications, which probably all of you have, obviously, and they're normally written to use standard interfaces. They are not written to use specific public cloud API services. So with the move into the cloud, um, there's the need to rewrite applications. And this might be a, a lot of work and effort and resources, which you might not even be able to scope right away. Even here, Mapper can help. So by providing that set of open APIs and abstracting from the cloud specifics, we can actually enable a way to kind of get rid of those silos. Because if you see here, if you rewrite the application, even nowadays for one of the public cloud providers, it works. But if you decide another day to move to another vendor or to move to back to the private cloud or to an edge, it will not work out of the box. With MapR, we can provide you with a solution and have this kind of an open API here and help you to get the application ready to deploy on independent of, of the cloud or on-premise environments. And this is not only just for, for the application and, and storage discussion, but also from a security perspective. As you can set up, as said initially, a single security concept and apply that globally to your environments here. As a bonus, looking at the fifth point here, assuming it'll be easy to leverage data at the edge. I mean, some of you might even need to ingest or do edge analytics, right, to analyze process data where it's generated, whether it's uh, small retail offices, small locations you have somewhere um, where data is generated and you need to be flexible and really agile in doing some analytics right there before you then copy over and replicate the data to a bigger and centralized data center environment. Again, cloud providers, they're, they're starting to look at edge processing. There are a couple of offerings in the market, but it's really limited nowadays. And then again, it's kind of pretty cloud vendor specific again. Where we can again help you with from MapBar, we have a technology called its Mapper Edge, and it's basically just the same part of the data fabric, the same software, but it's really optimized to run on a small footprint implementation. So you can think of just running it on a small Intel NAC PC or something at, at remote locations. With our streaming technology, which is part of the data fabric, we can then make sure to replicate the data that is generated at the edge um, to another bigger environment, to a central data center wherever you need it, or even directly to a cloud environment, and then further process. So this is what we initially talked about, act locally, but learn globally. So obviously, you can also get your application up and running on the edge on top of that environment and do the pre-processing already there and kind of react in, in real time to anything that's happening. 
but you can make sure that all of the data generated at some point when the band with an internet connection is there gets replicated automatically to another bigger data center and you can use all of that information obviously for your traditional analytics and have this global view of all the data that's being uh, ingested wherever in uh, into your systems. So this is really kind of the way to, to extend the whole data fabric even to an edge location and make sure you're always having the single view on all of the different data. So to quickly come to, to a summary on that part, looking at the cloud stack, the public cloud is in general again, most of the time you're probably gonna look at the platform as a service offering. And this is where you have the control and where you think you're uploading your data to. And you don't have much control, limited or none at all, of the underlying stack. And in some cases, this is exactly what you're looking for because you just wanna get rid of that complexity. But in other cases, you might wanna regain control because there's a whole stack coming wherever platform as a service offering you choose, there's always a stack coming with it, the runtime, the resource orchestration, the data management, and ultimately the infrastructure. So in some cases, as I said, this might be acceptable, but if you're looking again at your data, you might wanna be back and control what happens to your data, um, how you can decide where to replicate data, even to decide to pull data back maybe into other locations. And this is where we, again, can help you with in giving you back the control of the data management, even if it's public cloud environments. So you have the freedom of choice, basically, to run the services on top, but we can give you full control of what's happening to your data. And then, basically, you're still able to leverage all of the infrastructure agility benefits the public cloud providers can offer you. And this is where normally most of the, the companies are actually pretty open and, and, and happy to hand over control because you're just providing very easy infrastructure as a services here, and that's fine, but you're still in control of what happens to the data sets. And with that, I'll uh, already come to uh, the summary slide. So with MapR as a good example of a modern global data fabric technology, we can help you on the journey to the cloud. So we can help you make your business applications become cloud ready and agnostic to the in underlying infrastructure. We can help you really make that move at your own pace. So whenever you decide that you wanna integrate cloud infrastructures into your environment with the freedom to actually decide what kind of data to move and where, and also make it easy to, uh, to change decisions at a later point and uh, to, yeah, to add or remove different um, cloud environments there. And we're actually doing that by kind of virtualizing the data. So basically we're decoupling the physical data location and offering you with this global data fabric, a logical path that helps your applications run agnostic to the underlying infrastructure and really serve the data where it's needed. And quality, so we're treating all data the same. So um, you can really think of as a true big data environment. So we're taking files, we're taking objects, we're table real-time streams, tables. So everything uh, is handled the same, especially when it comes to the security concepts and, um, and data access, etc. If you put up the security concept, it applies to all the different formats and all types of data, which is also really nice. And by that really providing you with a way to go on your journey to a data-driven business and, uh, and to cloud environments. And with that, I hand over to Mark and open up for questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Antje. So um, there's a quick question in there, Tony. I'm not sure if you can see those, uh, some from Belish. Is the data hotness managed dynamically and movement of data to different layer, including object storage, is done automatically? Yes, yeah, so it's probably a question more to the technical side, so happy to take that one. So for the object tiering, you can basically decide based on schedules and rules um, how to move the data. So you also can do it manually, but as your question is looking for more of the automated um, way, 
So you can set up a schedule when actually data is being moved. And then based on the rules you set, like um, if you haven't touched the, uh, the data, the files for like four weeks, um, you offload it. And so yes, you can set up rules and schedules to do that. So uh, yeah, I think I hope that answers your question. So as you mentioned, also the object storage. So the, the good thing is when, when we offload the data to an object store, we keep the meta information. So even um, if you need to query parts of the data, the later stage, um, the system still knows where the data is. So you get still the, um, the response on the query of all of the data. It might take a little bit longer, obviously, because we're pulling that out of an object storage. Um, but as we still keep the meta information, we keep track of the data. So at any given point in time, um, you can still recall the data if you need it for some analytics and, and query. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, Bilash has also said, while well, moving the data among cloud data environment across regions, how various data privacy slash uh, compliances, including GDPR, is met? Yes. Um, so obviously, technology alone isn't GDPR aware. <laughs> so we still need you to, to really work with the concept um, together, right? So what we can help you with is automate the process or decide where you want to like replicate the data. Um, the cloud providers actually do provide sometimes specific regions that are GDPR compliant, etc. But obviously, the whole compliance topic is is including technology, but also like process and people. You probably are aware of. So um, the general concept obviously has to exist and and be integrated in your company's processes. But then the technology can assist there and really help you. Also, if you need to prove for example, to, an, to a compliance or auditor, um, the data that is being generated in Europe isn't really leaving Europe, right, and, and things like that. So um, this is all things we can help you with because if you have, like, automated replication and you say, like, look, the system is just replicating those data sets within the Europe or within a specific GDPR-compliant availability zone, et cetera, this is something you can easily prove then because it's technology and rules but obviously, GDPR and compliance topics in general more complex than just um, a simple replication of data. But yeah, happy to, uh, to go into the discussion if you're interested. Just um, reach out to us and we can have a look at your specific requirements there maybe. Yeah, and I was just going to add to that. Um, if, if you do have kind of specific questions on, on GDPR, um, if you check out uh, a guy called David Mead, um, M-E-A-D, on LinkedIn. He, he's one of our uh, uh, UK team members, but uh, yeah, David posts pretty regularly um, about GDPR. I think he's, he's got over uh, 200 pieces of content on, on LinkedIn, but he's very uh, knowledgeable, likes to kind of share his thoughts. So uh, yeah, happy to uh, kind of connect you with, with David if uh, you've got further questions there. Excellent. And the last one, uh, Gareth's asking the question, will this slide, uh, Peck, be available to share for your reference? Yes, it certainly will. We'll also make the entire recording available as well in video format. So you can, again, you can watch that back at your leisure and also share with relevant members of the team. I don't think there's anything else uh, to sort of add on there. Uh, so we will be uh, we're just finalizing the next in the series, so we'll make everybody aware of those. Um, some things that might also be interesting, we've got a Microsoft Cognitive Services and Developing with AI workshop coming up on the 6th of November. So if you're interested in that, um, my details on the screen, please let me know. And for those that are looking into Azure, we have a a live lab, a free three-day live lab for anybody that's looking to migrate workloads or stand anything up in Azure, um, move that be at a dev system, high availability, disaster recovery, and the like. Um, we can certainly have a conversation around that. That's a three-day free um, Azure live lab that we're doing. So again, please get in contact with me. Um, oh, actually, another question that's just come in before we all go. Is there a roadmap available for Fabric? We can talk about roadmap individually. So we don't publish roadmap information, obviously, on our website. But if you're interested to learn more, what's coming with, uh, especially our next release, 6.1, which is just around the corner, just really uh, reach out to us, and uh, and we can definitely talk you through a couple of the ideas we're working on and what's coming Excellent. right across uh, a couple of days. Yeah, we've got a, we're planning a, a an update. Um, on our next release, uh, 6.1, so I believe it's the, the 24th of 
uh, October. But yeah, if you drop uh, Mark um, at Grey Matter Line, he can uh, send you the details of how to get registered. And and also we've got some links up on this slide. But uh, obviously, if you want to try MapR as a um, as actual software, you know there is uh, a free version available to download. But we've also you know all of our on-demand courses including um short introductory courses are free for you all to uh, to use as well so you just need to go to mapr.com forward slash training and uh, set up a, an account and uh, yeah you, you can kind of just uh, get a bit more detail at your own pace excellent and just a quick question that's come up in relation to the three-day live lab again please drop me an email and then i'll engage with our services guys to ensure that you know things are in place so yeah more than happy just send me an email and basically anything related to this or anything else i've spoke, spoken about if you come via me and then if it's not something i can handle i'll certainly put you in contact with the relevant person at mapar or internally Excellent. So if there is nothing further, thank you everybody for attending. Huge thanks to Antia and Tony for helping us make this a fantastic webinar. And as I say, we will be sharing the complete recording and slide deck. So please feel free to share, ask more questions and do get back in contact if there's anything else and keep an eye out for the next webinar with MAPAR that will be coming up uh, reasonably soon. So thank you everybody. Have a fantastic afternoon and look forward to in touching, uh, touching base with you again in the future. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.